We have a tremendous amount of confidence in the FDA review processes and an independent group under the CDC called, called the Advisory Council on Immunization Practices or ACIP. And again, we've been watching very closely with the processes and the discussions that have been taking place under those bodies. And uh, we feel very confident with the work that they have done to ensure safety and effectiveness. Uh, I wanna make sure also that people are well aware that um, although safety has been closely monitored through the, uh, through the clinical trial process, um, there will be ongoing monitoring for safety of, um, of these products as they, as they come um, into Delawareans. And um, there are processes in place, one that's been in place for a long time called VAERS, Vaccine Adverse Event Reporting System, which our providers are very used to reporting if there's any adverse event uh, related to a vaccine. But there's also a new system called Be Safe that has been set up for um, this the COVID vaccination initiative. And every single person who gets vaccinated will learn will get information about Be Safe. Um, they'll have interactions through their phone, and they'll be able to report any any um, any side effects that might be seen. And through that, we're going to learn. Uh, we're going to learn more about these these vaccines for sure. Let me dig into a little bit on the next slide, the um, three key phases of um, the vaccine clinical trials that have um, already um, uh, taken place for this vaccine. The first phase is um, where the vaccine is given to small numbers of people just to, to see if it's safe. And again, this vaccine um, did well with the phase one trials. Then it went on to phase two, which was to determine if the vaccine produces an immune response, which again, it did very well. Um, and then finally, it went through what's called a randomized clinical trial. And so half the people received placebo, half the people received the real drug and people didn't know. Um, which they received. And through this study of over 30,000 people, um, not only was this vaccine again shown to be safe, but very effective. In fact, I think this is one of the things we're most excited about is that this um, vaccine is um, more effective than I think any of us um, by far ex expected, over 90% efficacy, which is really really fantastic. So again, it did go through all of the um, appropriate clinical trials. In fact, over 40,000 people were involved in these three phases. And so again, that gives us a lot of reassurance for this vaccine. Next, I wanna just touch base on the three vaccines. So we've been talking about the Pfizer vaccine tonight, which um, was submitted in on November 20th for its FDA emergency use authorization approval. Um, it got that approval on Friday, um, and from that, um, materials um, have been developed um, that tells people more about the findings of um, of the FDA, um, including you know any potential side effects, which we'll talk more about. Um, and so now that vaccine has already arrived here, um, and we'll be uh, certainly getting more. Uh, this week and in the coming weeks. Uh, Moderna is a very similar vaccine that um, is in the process of getting its EUA approval. Um, it's a week behind the Pfizer one, so we expect that it will likely get its approval on Friday because it again has been found to be very effective and safe, so we don't expect um, that one to be held up as well. And then if that all you know, if all happens as expected with the Moderna vaccine, we should be receiving that in Delaware next week as well. Um, there's another one that has been uh, created by AstraZeneca. And um, this one um, is continuing to go through some additional um, study. Um, you may have heard that one smaller group had a 90% efficacy um, and that group um, accidentally, the, um, 
the participants received half the dose the first time and the full dose the second time. And it actually um, it was more um, effective that way than the rest of the folks in the trial. So there are um, scientists looking at this closely. Um, and again, I think this shows you how careful everyone is um, when uh, moving vaccines forward. So um, although this vaccine has a tremendous amount of promise, um, scientists want to know more before it gets approved. So more to come on the AstraZeneca vaccine. So with the Pfizer one that's now in Delaware, um, there were over 40,000 trial participants. Um, they've been followed for a median of two months um, following the second dose. Um, in general, side effects are usually within the first the first day really, or the first three days of getting a vaccine. So um, as, as you can see, following for two months um, um, is, is certainly a good amount of time. Now they'll be following for, um, for certainly longer, um, all these trial participants, um, as well as, you know, all members of the public that get the vaccine going forward. Um, the Pfizer vaccine study participants were between the ages of 16 to 92 with a median age of 52. And the volunteers in this trial included thousands of racially and ethnically diverse individuals. And so um, th this is really helpful, more people with more diversity in a, for a variety of different factors um, were included in this trial, uh, which helps us understand the, the impacts on different groups. So let's talk a little bit about what the emergency use authorization allows. It was approved for individuals ages 16 and older. It was not studied for children under the age of 16. So it is not approved for children under the age of 16 yet. Um, it is not recommended for people who have had a severe allergic reaction after a previous dose of this vaccine, which at this point in time, um, pretty much no one has received or very few people have received um, uh, this vaccine. Uh, during the trial, there were um, no individuals who had severe allergic reactions, but there have been several in the UK since. So while scientists are looking into that, um, the recommendation is if um, uh, people have had severe allergic reactions or anaphylaxis, that they should talk to their doctor first before getting this vaccine. Additionally, because uh, there were not an adequate number of pregnant and breastfeeding um, uh, women who were part of this study. Um, although it is believed that it is that it is safe in this group, it's important to talk to your physician for guidance if you are pregnant or breastfeeding. Additionally, for those who are immunocompromised, uh, they should talk to their phys physician as well. On the next slide, Let's talk about side effects, which is really important. Every vaccine has some potential side effects and the most common include headache, fatigue, muscle ache, chills, and injection site soreness. Um, some people get fever as well. Um, lots of people don't get any side effects, um, especially with the first dose. Some people get more side effects with the, with the second dose. Um, generally, they are mild side effects and they go away within 24 hours. So there's no need to seek medical care unless symptoms linger or worsen. But um, again, I think it's important for people to know, just like often with the, with the flu vaccine, that there are people that just feel under the weather for the 24 hours after getting the vaccine. Um, but it's certainly not uh, the same as getting COVID-19, um, especially for those who have um, the uh, more significant symptoms of COVID-19. Um, again, FDA and CDC will continue to monitor initial and all vaccine recipients for any adverse reactions. So let's talk a little bit about rumors around the vaccines. Um, as we have um, 
as we have mentioned, side effects are common in, in, in vaccines, but no severe side effects have been identified um, from these vaccines. And the a um, uh, couple of cases of severe allergic reaction that has been seen in the UK, again, are, be, are being looked into closely. Um, uh, in, those are individuals who have had a very strong history of severe allergic reactions or anaphylaxis in the past, which is why we want to be very careful with um, administration of the vaccine for those who've had an anaphylactic reaction, but it's not contraindicated, meaning people who have allergies should still get the vaccine. There were also several cases of people in the trial who had Bell's palsy, but it um, is found that there's no direct link um, to the vaccine um, in these cases. So the, the vaccine is not felt to have caused these cases of Bell's palsy. Um, additionally, there are two individuals who passed away during the, um, during the clinical trials, but their deaths were not related to the vaccine. The first person to take the vaccine in the UK was is not in critical condition. And also another rumor that the placebo um, um, it was deadly. The de placebo was not deadly. It's a solution of saline and, and water. So I think the bottom line point is um, make sure you read but beyond the headlines. Um, the other thing that we've seen out there in the media is, is um, people thinking that this is going to be a mandatory vaccine. And at this point in time, we, we don't know that anybody is considering making this vaccine mandatory. One of the things that complicates this vaccine is that it needs to be stored at a really, really cold temperature, negative 70 degrees Celsius. Um, so there's multiple refrigerators now or deep um, um, ultra cold storage uh, units here in our state that are able to store the vaccine, which, which is great. And so Pfizer plans to ship directly to the hospitals or places that have those that cold storage as well as um, DPH and we have the cold storage freezer as well. A question that we get a lot from a lot of people on the next slide is how much is this gonna cost? Um, the US government is purchasing this vaccine um, and plans to provide it to people for free. Now providers who administer the vaccine or um, put it in people's arms um, can bill for an office visit and they can charge a vaccine administration fee. But um, for those who are unable to pay, who don't have insurance, providers must administer the vaccine um, regardless of a, a person's ability to, to pay. Um, so vaccine providers may seek appropriate reimbursement uh, from an insurance plan but for uninsured patients, the vaccine provider can seek reimbursement from other sources that are available. And with that, I am gonna hand this off to Dr. Rick Hong, who has done an amazing job leading these efforts of uh, uh, getting us onto the details of this complex mission. Great, thank you very much, Dr. Rate. It's a pleasure being here to talk more about where we stand with the vaccine allocation process. Um, you see here is the front cover of the COVID-19 vaccination playbook. This could be found in our vaccine website, which is coronavirus.delaware.gov slash vaccine. Uh, this gives you an overview of what our approach is to the vaccine allocation process. And this is a living document. You can imagine the information is changing very frequently. So uh, this uh, document has gone through several uh, updates and I anticipate additional updates as well as we continue on this journey together. Um, you know, we really appreciate all the uh, partnerships we have uh, within the state, the medical community, um, as well as uh, other partners within the state, outside the state, uh, local communities as well too, because really uh, this is something that DPH cannot do by itself. And we really need to work together with all our partners to be successful uh, in this mission to get uh, vaccine out as quickly as possible uh, to everyone who wants a vaccine. 
So kind of giving you an overview of what we've done so far and the planning really started early on. We always knew that a vaccine will be coming out shortly. Uh, so we've been working on this for months. Um, and, you know, uh, fortunately for us within DPH, we've had plans in place already uh, for mass vaccination. Um, I'm not sure how many of you uh, recall H1N1, but we anticipate doing a very similar uh, approaches that we did for H1N1 and distributing the vaccine to the public. So we've been meeting internally uh, within DPH, also within DHSS, Department of Health and Social Services, um, and regularly with the Office of the Governor. Um, we have trained immunizations program staff to utilize national vaccine tracking system. Uh, we are fortunate enough to have a robust um, statewide immunization registry system called Delvax. So you might be hearing that word uh, frequently uh, as we talk about vaccine. Uh, that's going to be our, our, our central location for reporting, um, ordering, uh, and other activities related to vaccine allocation. Uh, we have run uh, several tabletop exercises and facilitate discussion. Uh, we have gone through various scenarios, some of which can be located in the playbook. Um, but, you know, we want to kind of address many of the common and some uncommon scenarios that may occur uh, during the vaccine allocation process. Uh, we have several stakeholders meeting. Just for example, we do have a general task force group as well as communication subcommittee. Uh, we also, also have an ethics advisory group uh, to kind of talk about the ethical principles related to equity uh, regarding the distribution of vaccine. Um, again, we're very fortunate to have a lot of uh, experts within the state to kind of provide guidance uh, in how to approach this. Uh, there are many other meetings as well too, uh, sub -meet, subgroups, uh, subcommittees as well, uh, just in general during the entire uh, COVID-19 response. Um, so we just tacked on the vaccine discussion in many of those meetings. Uh, we did receive a test or dummy shipment from Pfizer on December 3rd and December 8th to make sure that our warehouse is functional and ready to receive and that went successfully. Also gave us an opportunity to look at the special vaccine shipper that the uh, vaccine came with um, so that, again, to provide some additional experience and training for our logistics staff. Uh, so we are uh, looking at centralizing vaccine program staff as well. Um, you know, we have many committed um, employees, not just within uh, DPH, but also within other state agencies. Um, and that you know, we do understand the uh, different mission regarding vaccine distribution compared to other activities within uh, COVID-19 response. So we are looking to um, really centralizing those resources for better effectiveness uh, for the program itself. Um, we are enrolling vaccinators in the federal program. There are a couple of requirements related to this vaccine. Um, there is an enrollment process um, for providers interested in receiving vaccine, um, but also there is a reporting uh, requirement um, to update daily inventory of vaccine at several locations. So it is important for providers who are interested in participating to know that uh, you must be enrolled to meet those requirements provided by the federal government. Next slide, please. So ethics is really a, a, a critical piece of, of this discussion and allocation process. Um, you know, this ethics advisory group was developed long ago during one of our planning uh, groups um, regarding pandemic response. And we felt that given the um, chance for limited resources, especially during a pandemic, that we wanna make sure that we had a group of uh, folks with some training or background in ethics to be able to provide some guidance on how to include ethical principles in our decision-making process. So this ethics advisory group was created years ago, and this group was involved in H1N1, uh, as well as several other um, events that happened throughout the state to really focus on ensuring equitable vaccination access across the entire population. Um, you know, very different from H1N1. Uh, this, there are challenges that did not exist uh, during that event, uh, particularly as Dr. Take kind of went over regarding the logistical operational um, limitations with these vaccines, such as as mentioned for Pfizer, requiring ultra cold chain storage at negative 70 degrees Celsius. Um, so the ethics advisory group is a, um, um, a group um, that provides recommendations to the director's office. Um, you know, we are advisory groups, as I mentioned before, uh, using those uh, experts uh, on the group uh, to provide recommendations to Dr. Rate on how best to uh, determine uh, tiered allocation groups. Next slide, please. So when is this gonna happen? So we just got our first shipment in and we anticipate additional shipments later uh, during the week. 
Um, and this is going to be a phase rollout. And this is something I would like to emphasize, something very different from H1N1, where um, we had priority groups identifying H1N1. Uh, given the limited supply and the challenges with this vaccine, we want to reduce any waste as possible. Um, so we want to make sure that there are, there are flexibilities within the process to allow providers to vaccinate um, multiple phases um, to avoid waste, as I mentioned already. So the phase rollout, um, we do have phases that overlap. Uh, again, you can think from the operational perspective that if there are vaccines left over after you vaccinate, for instance, healthcare staff at a given facility, um, instead of wasting it, uh, we want you to be able to vaccinate potentially residents, potentially patients, or other staff that may not fit in that original phase uh, category uh, to reduce waste. Uh, limited supply initially, again, it's critical. We have a process in place to kind of uh, guide us how to allocate vaccine. Um, and as more supply is available, you're going to see chain uh, channels uh, open up for vaccine. And we anticipate once there is enough vaccine that we will be able to rely on the normal uh, channels to receive vaccines, such as your primary provider offices, um, as well as pharmacies. So for December to January, we anticipate we're going to focus on phase one groups. And, you know, um, there are some a further discussion of what those phase one groups are. Uh, recently, the ethics advisor group made formal recommendations to Dr. Rate uh, regarding um, those uh, folks that will be, uh, that should be receiving vaccine early on. And that composed of healthcare personnel, as well as long-term care facility residents. And these guidelines, recommendation, I should say, follow the guidelines um, presented by the advisory committee on immunization practices. And um, those phases will be posted on our website as well too, to kind of help guide the public on how, how the vaccine allocation process stands. Um, and as I mentioned, in the spring, we anticipate more vaccine available for the general public, and we are hoping that we can work through our uh, partners that currently um, provide normal channels for vaccine to do so for the COVID-19 vaccine. Next slide, please. So these are the anticipated tiered allocation groups, and phase 1A, as identified um, already, that they're going to be your healthcare personnel um, as well, um, you know, the healthcare personnel group includes your first responders, EMS, um, and then as well as long-term care staff, as well as residents. And these recommendations uh, follow what the um, CDC ACIP group uh, formally recommended. Um, they are in discussion on what else will fall into phase one, uh, whether it's going to be phase 1B or phase 1C or so forth. Um, but we anticipate, given what we are seeing right now from ACIP, uh, that um, those groups will include essential critical uh, infrastructure workers uh, in other high-risk settings that do not include healthcare settings, uh, those with certain underlying chronic conditions as identified by the CDC, and also those in high-risk group settings such as uh, department corrections, homeless shelters and group homes, and as well as age greater than equal 65 years, uh, that group, um, as well as those other groups mentioned, um, are at highest risk for burden for disease, whether it's hospitalization or even death. Next slide, please. So this is what I kind of want to show you regarding the phase rollout process. This is not prioritization. Uh, prioritization implies that you have to finish one group before you move on to another. Uh, so as you notice here, there is overlapping of multiple phases. So there are opportunities to vaccinate multiple phases at the same time, again, given the situation, uh, given the supply of vaccine as well. Um, so this kind of gives you an idea, uh, the projection of when certain phases will start. Again, we may start earlier, we may start later, depending on the vaccine supply that we are receiving. And again, we are really um, eager to work with our partners to develop uh, models, processes to be able to get vaccine out as quickly as possible. So, you know, looking to businesses, if they can set up a vaccination um, site within their business to um, be able to vaccinate as many employees as possible would be one example. You know, working with health systems to be able to um, vaccinate additional people outside of the health system. So there are really exciting opportunities here. Some of these models have been done before and others are fairly new. Um, you know, we just met with our pharmacy partners and they are a great resource here and experts in vaccination and opportunities to um, have pharmacists be deployed to certain sites to vaccinate or to open up their stores to allow uh, COVID-19 vaccination to occur within uh, certain phase groups. Next slide, please. So talking a little bit about uh, vaccine administration. Next slide. Thank you. Uh, so DPH places all the orders um, and most are direct shipped to vaccinate entities. Again, uh, given if they are able to store the vaccine, receive the vaccine, and if they're able to uh, use up the doses that come with the orders. 
um, healthcare systems uh, plan to vaccinate staff internally. However, there's interest in vaccinating people outside the health system, for ex uh, example, first responders. Um, we are working closely with the county paramedic agencies in the, um, in the state to vaccinate not only EMS providers and other first responders as well, too. And there's also opportunities for EMS uh, personnel to vaccinate the general public. Uh, in the state of Delaware, uh, paramedics are authorized to vaccinate, which is a huge resource that we can take advantage of during this event. Uh, we've already discussed with multiple pharmacies. Uh, pharmacies, uh, particular CVS and Walgreens, particip are participating in the federal pharmacy program. Uh, so we will be relying on them to vaccinate long-term care residents. And this is a separate uh, initiative than what we are doing within the state. So we appreciate the uh, resources provided at the federal level and through these larger chain pharmacies to be able to address this uh, vulnerable population. For the general public, like I mentioned, once vaccine becomes more available, we can look upon the primary care offices, uh, federally qualified health centers, pharmacies, uh, RDPH clinics, drive-throughs. So typically what we're familiar with in how we get vaccine out to the public. So again, based on available supply, we are hoping we can tap on and tap into those uh, channels to be able to disperse vaccine to the public. Um, this is where it's important, part of the reporting uh, requirements I mentioned earlier, that any entity that receives vaccines must report daily how many are administered. Uh, and this is why the enrollment process is in place to allow us to meet this requirement for daily inventory um, submissions. Next slide, please. So, um, Another twist, I guess, to this uh, vaccine is, um, at least for Pfizer and Moderna, uh, two doses are part of the series. Um, it is highly recommended that both doses are completed. So if you finish one dose, you might get some effectiveness, but you will not get the bigger bang for your buck if you complete uh, uh, the series. So, you know, we do want to encourage folks that, you know, please get both doses to really get that maximum effect, uh, both in time as well as for efficacy. Um, so there are a couple of ways that um, can be used for second dose reminders. Um, each um, uh, vaccine uh, dose is uh, uh, given a, a record card as well, too, to kind of give you um, uh, information on when your next dose should be. Um, also, reminder letters are a possibility. Through our Delvax, we can get uh, automation in sending reminder letters to patients. And again, as long as we have the information with valid address in Delvax, that will uh, help us reach out to um, um, the public for uh, repeat doses. So again, it's important to get that contact information. And then we're working with uh, possibilities with vendors to have an automated phone call, SMS reminders and so forth uh, to really um, uh, remind folks for the second dose, you know, looking through other channels besides a letter. So, you know, if, if it could be email, it could be text messages, so forth. And again, working closely with our partners, uh, many of our partners already have a reminder system in place and we encourage to use those systems um, uh, for this process as well, too. So, you know, the, like the message here very important is that the, the uh, Pfizer and Moderna requires two doses and really to get the biggest benefit from the vaccine, both doses are needed. Next slide, please. So going over some resources that are available, I did mention earlier that we do have a vaccine website um, which is coronavirus.delaware.gov slash vaccine. Um, but we also understand that we want to provide general messaging uh, through what media is available. For instance, social media is gonna be a big help here sharing that message. So you can see here some of the examples we have. Um, you know, it's important to realize that there are, um, there's, there is a lot of information out there regarding the vaccine. Some of it um, is accurate, some of it may not be accurate. So we wanna make sure we provide the most accurate information to allow individuals to make informed decisions. Um, so you can see here some of the uh, general messaging uh, that we are gonna provide. Um, graphics is a good way to uh, share messaging. Next slide, please. And testimonies might be very powerful as well too, uh, to really hear individuals, real Delawareans, giving their reason why they're getting the vaccine. So, you know, opportunities there to really just capture uh, those, those thoughts and those rationales. So you can see here uh, on the picture on the left, uh, this person's getting the vaccine because I uh, want to put my pointy shoes on and get back to ballet classes and dance. So understand the importance of how the vaccine plays a role in the overall mitigation strategy for a COVID-19 response. And it's a critical component. We need to get as many people vaccinated as possible to eliminate the spread of further uh, disease uh, within the community. So, you know, hoping that we get enough people here, uh, then this doctor would be able to go back uh, and start uh, dancing again, which is great. Uh, you can see the uh, pictorial on the right. Uh, I'm getting the COVID-19 vaccine because it is better to be safe than sorry. 
Um, so uh, we're hoping to get more testimonies and kind of hear reasons why we're doing this. Um, and I think it really does help kind of understand why people are choosing uh, this vaccine. Next slide, please. Other resource materials, um, I already mentioned the uh, vaccine website. There are many ways to get to the website. You can just Google COVID uh, vaccine Delaware and you also get to the website as well too. Uh, within the website, you can see the picture on the right. Uh, you can see specific links for specific groups. Uh, there's a link for general public. Uh, there's a link for information for medical providers. Here you'll get information on how to enroll into the program and you'll get some more specific information on the technical pieces of the vaccine. Uh, we also have a separate link for agencies, organizations, businesses. We want to take advantage of the infrastructure within businesses and how businesses can bring people of many different backgrounds within their employee staff to a certain site to get vaccinated. So it's a very a good way to get the vaccine out to a diverse um, group of people. Um, and we're hoping that we can work closely with businesses and help them through the process and be able to send vaccine to those workplaces. And then finally, a lot of talk about uh, vaccine safety and hopefully Dr. Rote was able to share some of that information with you. If you would like additional information regarding vaccine safety, please go onto the website and you can learn more about the safety aspects. Uh, one thing I do wanna mention, uh, there have been a lot of concerns uh, that I've heard regarding how quickly the vaccine was uh, completed um, and people are are concerned that, you know, is safety good? What are uh, corners were cut? And frankly, uh, the corners that were cut were not related to the safety. It might be related to, for instance, the administrative or the red tape aspect to get a vaccine through the EUA process. Um, the vaccines went through all the necessary clinical trials. And again, we do have a, a adverse event reporting system in place because we want to make sure that um, we are capturing all adverse events that could potentially happen. Um, so uh, 40,000, 30,000 folks uh, for the two vaccines uh, went through the clinical trials, which is a large number, uh, but we have under a million people in Delaware. So there are potential that, you know, we might see additional side effects. We want to make sure we're capturing them and guaranteeing the safety throughout this event. Um, vaccine safety section I mentioned already too, and the vaccine re monitoring reporting coming. Um, again, we want to share data regarding how we're doing with vaccination. And again, there's a website below there. Next slide, please. And for um, additional vaccine information, any questions, uh, general questions, please send them to uh, vaccine at Delaware.gov. Uh, and we will answer them uh, and provide additional information as needed. But again, please feel free to use our current website um, for the vaccine and we will be updating that website regularly um, as more information becomes available. Uh, data on vaccines will be provided um, on My Healthy Community. I'm hoping that many of you are familiar with My, Happy, uh, My Healthy Community. That's where we kind of share our metrics regarding COVID-19 in general. Uh, we are doing something very similar with vaccines. So you can kind of see how we're doing and if there, are uh, if there are opportunities for improvement as well too. And then the general COVID-19 website, don't forget that. Please remember how important testing is. Uh, so we still do have our testing website available and just general information on coronavirus 19. So please consider, please remember to use that website as well too. You can see in the bottom, that's a, a banner of the uh, coronavirus 19 data dashboard, which you can kind of get an overview of how we're doing. And you can see cases, you can see deaths, hospitalizations. And then again, testing is still a critical part of this. Uh, after you get vaccinated, doesn't mean you don't have to, you know, follow any of the infection control measures that you still have to wear a mask, you still have to uh, uh, social distance, and you still have to wash your hands frequently. And testing, again, is, uh, is recommended. Uh, when we're talking about viral testing, that means the PCR or the antigen testing, um, that, you know, the vaccine will not alter the um, results of that test. So you can still continue to get tested. Um, and I think it's important, as you know, vaccines are not 100%. Uh, we are all familiar with the flu vaccine that um, sometimes you can still get the flu after the vaccine. However, uh, the vaccine should be decreasing the acuity and the severity of the symptoms. And we anticipate the same for the coronavirus 19 vaccine. So um, please re remember to still follow those infection control measures until we get to a point where we are seeing significantly reduce uh, community spread. Next slide, please. Uh, social media handles, please follow DPH on, on you know, Facebook, you got Twitter, Instagram, um, YouTube as well too. So, you know, if you want to get additional information, uh, please remember to use these uh, social media handles. Next slide, please. And that's all I got. Well, I appreciate your time. I'll turn it back to Jill, maybe. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hong. <clears throat> and thank you, Dr. Rattay, for your presentation as well. And as you can imagine, we have lots and lots of questions. 
So let's see if we can get to some of those. I think we have lots of questions about uh, from people about how they get the vaccine. Do they have to pre-register? How, how do they go about the logistics of actually um, getting signed up to get the vaccine? So I'll start on with that. So again, it, it, this is going to be evolving process where, you know, depending on the supply, we're going to be focusing on our phase groups. Uh, so, you know, in the phase uh, 1A group where we're targeting healthcare personnel and we're targeting long-term care residents, we're going to be offering uh, opportunities to get the vaccine specifically through those settings. So it could be through a healthcare setting. It could be through EMS. It could be through um, a vaccination site uh, specifically targeting healthcare professionals, you know, working closely with employers of healthcare personnel to see if they can provide a vaccination site internally uh, at their work site. Um, and again, working with the federal uh, pharmacy program uh, for long-term care residents. So as we expand our supply, we will be expanding our access points and that'll be including uh, primary care, that'll be including pharmacies, um, as well as other uh, inventory uh, outlets as well. So at this point, there's no registration process um, because we are focused on certain groups. But again, we are working to see what's the best way to get that vaccine out. And we do realize there needs to be multiple ways of access that we cannot just focus on one model. Um, so, you know, more, more to come on that once we get additional vaccine. All right. And as, as both of you can imagine, we have lots of questions from seniors about the vaccine. Uh, the first one, they want to know how, uh, how will those who are 65 and older and live in a 55 plus community be notified of the COVID-19 vaccines dates of availability? So again, we're going to work closely with our Office of Communications to share that information. You know, we, it, I like the idea of, of targeting communities that have um, these uh, high risk groups in there so we can maximize our efficiency for vaccine distribution. So opportunities to work closely with uh, these communities, working closely with uh, independent living facilities and so forth, and maybe potentially bringing a team to them to be able to vaccine as many people as possible. Uh, again, as you can imagine, given the, the limitation of the vaccine, you have to have ultra cold chain. Uh, once you uh, tap into a body, you have six hours to use up all the doses. So we wanna make sure we don't waste any doses. So bringing the vaccine to a larger group might be a, a better model initially, uh, rather than having them um, you know, at a certain site have people come. Uh, but again, it depends on the vaccine, depends on the scenario, but those are some options we have. And then I think a follow-up question, does it, is there a difference whether someone who is six, older than 65 is healthy or whether they have underlying health conditions? So that's a great question. Just the age greater than or equal 65 is a risk factor. Uh, so if you have multiple risk factors, in addition to age, you have certain chronic medical conditions, then that might put you at a higher risk. So I would urge that once the opportunity for vaccine um, arises and that you have multiple risk factors that you need to get that vaccine. Um, but just the age alone that's greater than or equal 65 is a high risk factor. And Dr. Rate, and following up on that, and it's a really interesting question. Uh, how does the administration affect snowbirds who may, who may be going to Florida or Arizona or some other warmer place this winter? Uh, how, how will that work for them? Yeah, so um, when it becomes available for individuals, wherever they are, they should take advantage of it. So if a snowbird is in Florida, at the time when it's available for them, they should take it in Florida. Um, if they're here in Delaware, they should take it here in Delaware. Um, I, I, I want to re reiterate, you know, something that Dr. Hong focused in on, which is, you know, early on, um, our first doses go um, go to hospitals where they they will distribute to healthcare workers, and we'll be working directly with long term care facilities for residents and and snap and staff as well as EMS. So it will be a little while um, before it becomes available publicly to um, uh, to the uh, to those higher risk individuals, those over age sixty five, those with chronic underlying conditions, um, snowbirds who are uh, heading down to Florida or may already be there, but um, wherever you are, when it becomes available to you, you should take advantage of it. Thank you, Dr. Rate. And I think this is a really important um, point that someone is bringing up. If you receive, when you receive the vaccine, do you need to continue to wear a mask? If a mask is not required, how will one not be penalized? 
so that, that there's no worry for pen, penalties because you still need to wear a mask uh, because it's not 100% of a vaccine that there's still a risk of getting sick, just like the flu and uh, any other vaccines, that the vaccine does not give you a get out of jail free card that you don't have to uh, wear the mask anymore or you don't have to social distance and things like that. So really the infection control measures that we've been pushing all this time during COVID-19 still apply uh, when you, uh, even after the vaccine. All right, Dr. Tay, we have a high rate of diabetes in Delaware and someone wants to know, is the vaccine safe for people with type two diabetes? Absolutely, the, safe, the vaccine is safe for people with type two diabetes and uh, diabetes is a risk factor for more significant consequences of COVID-19. So we absolutely recommend that people with diabetes take advantage of the, the vaccine when it is available for them. All right, and I think this is a fascinating question. What if someone uh, takes the first dose and then they contract COVID-19 before they are scheduled to receive the second dose? What happens? So, so that's an interesting scenario. So I think the um, answer to this question is that, that those that have uh, been positive in the past still should get the vaccine. So that's not a a uh, reason not to get the vaccine because there is no lifelong immunity based on studies performed by the CDC. Uh, that even if you've been positive that you can still lose that immunity and the vaccine will be needed to expand that immunity. So one of the contraindications or I should say a relative contraindication is that if you have moderate or significant illness which is, could be related to COVID or not, that you should hold off on getting the vaccine unless your provider thinks it's a good idea for various reasons. And as Dr. Gorte mentioned, that diabetes heightens uh, the risk, so you need to balance the risk and benefit. But for your question as well too, um, regarding uh, the vaccine, you can get the vaccine regardless if you had COVID in the past or not. But I do also wanna mention that you know, uh, for Pfizer, it's a 21 day separation between the two doses. And for Moderna, it's a 28 day separation. Um, you don't have to be exact on the 21st day or the 28th day. That there are, you can be a little bit late and you don't have to start over, which is a good thing, but it doesn't mean that you should wait around and just put it off. That once there's an opportunity uh, beyond the 21 days or 28 days, um, they can get the vaccine, you should get it. Uh, but I just want people to know that don't be panicky if you're late by a day or two. Okay. All right, uh, next up. Uh, someone asked, will residents of neighboring states who receive all their medical care and, and work in Delaware be able to receive the vaccine in Delaware? Yeah, so I'll take that one. I mean, especially those who healthcare providers who work in our state um, will uh, be offered the vaccine through their employer. Um, it's important that at any healthcare provider who's providing uh, care for um, Delawareans be protected. Um, residents are covered by the allocation the federal government provides uh, for the state that they're in. So, you know, our recommendation is that residents, um, if it's not, if you're not employed here, um, that you uh, get your vaccine in the state in which you reside. And Dr. Hong, I don't know if you wanna add anything to that. So, so, uh, so for an example, um, I work out of state as a, a physician. So I'm actually getting my vaccine out of state because that's where I am a, a risk uh, for. Uh, my current role, state medical director, since I don't have patient contact, I would not consider myself as, as a high risk here in Delaware. So I am respecting the process as well. And my hospital has already counted me in their numbers. So you kind of have to imagine how the counting goes. And if you are a healthcare uh, professional, they're going to count based on where you work. Uh, so kind of keep that in mind. And it really bounces out. I don't anticipate we're going to be checking ID and confirming residents. And, you know, if there's someone who's out of state that we're going to say, no, you can't have it. Because it's going to go both ways regardless how you look at it. All right. And then we want to get into some of the some of the other categories. Are grocery store workers essential workers? In which phase would they be included? Okay. So that's a good question. So in general, your essential and critical infrastructure um, staff, as mentioned in the slides, um, they will be later in after 1A. So we tentatively have put in 1B because we are waiting for further recommendation from CDC on how to place. But currently, ACIP is recommending that essential uh, workers, non-healthcare related, are placed in phase 1B. All right, and, and grocery store workers would yes. fit in that category. Yes, thank you. I forgot that. <laughs> and, and really, 
And, and really to expand on that, I mean, people who interact with the public are um, um, essential employees that interact with the public um, fit in that category. All right, next up. Um, when you talked a little bit uh, about side effects, will side effects cause people to be out of work? Will they, will they miss some days of work because of side effects? So, so everyone's very different. And um, Dr. Tay went through the side effects um, and people react differently. So it's hard to say that you definitely can go to work. Um, you know, everyone's gonna make the best decision whether they can go to work or not. Um, so, you know, something to consider, uh, you know, that if you can plan your vaccine around, you know, a day or two before you have time off so that you don't impact your, your workplace. And you can also imagine, especially for those situations where employers are uh, accepting uh, responsibility for vaccinating staff, that you, don't, you gotta be careful who you're vaccinating because if for some reason you're vaccinating one type of worker and for some bad luck, some of them uh, have to uh, call out of work because of side effects that might actually impact your operations. So there's some planning needed within uh, workplaces on who to vaccinate. All right, now, Dr. Hong, on that same kind of line, is there any interaction between a flu shot and the COVID vaccine? Will getting a flu shot within weeks of getting a COVID vaccine be problematic? Um, so right now, the studies aren't there to say whether it's safe to get both vaccines simultaneously. Uh, so it is recommended that you should have two weeks or 14 days around um, the vaccines. So, you know, waiting two weeks in between vaccines is considered the recommendation. Um, but however, uh, I would caution uh, getting both vaccines at the same time uh, because there's really not studies out there. All right. And a, a question about allergies. You mentioned those as well. Does it uh, there was an issue with someone with multiple allergies on the vaccine. Does this mean someone with only a peanut allergy who has an EpiPen cannot or should not take the vaccine? Yeah, so it's really those who've had uh, serious um, allergic reactions and, um, uh, and an anaphylactic reaction that are of the most concern. But, you know, that being said, somebody with a peanut allergy um, who has epinephrine should talk to their doctor first. And you wanna make sure that, that, that they get their vaccine in a place where somebody's able to monitor for more serious allergic reactions and, and to be able to respond if somebody has a more serious allergic reaction. All right, and then I think, you know, really a really good uh, big picture question. What percentage of population needs to be vaccinated before we can eradicate COVID-19? You want me uh, I to guess, start with that or you want to go, Rick? <laughs> uh, so, so really, there really is no number per se. I mean, there are different models that say maybe 50%, maybe 70%. I mean, it's really hard to say because we don't know how many people have um, are still immune. Um, so I, I think the uh, answer is we get as many people vaccinated as possible. Um, Dr. Tay may have a better answer than what I gave. Well, I mean, nobody does have a magic uh, a magic number. A lot of experts are saying you want to see a good 70% of your population um, be vaccinated to suggest that you may have herd immunity. But, um, you know, we don't, we don't know. We have a lot to learn still. But um, I think um, the importance of this, this question, as Dr. Hong was saying, is unfortunately, you know, it is going to be a little while before uh, the, net, the masks are not you know, a regular part of our wardrobe. <laughs> All right, we have a, a question about someone with a, a compromised immune system, such as from an organ transplant, whether it's a heart transplant or a kidney transplant. Is, it, is that considered high risk and is it safe to get the vaccine? So if you look up to CDC, if you Google CDC medical conditions, COVID-19, they actually give you uh, two lists. One is considered a higher uh, risk versus the other one, but both are at risk for um, severe uh, consequences from COVID-19. So immunocompromised state from a solid organ uh, transplant, for instance, is considered a high risk and should definitely be vaccinated. All right, here's an, uh, a good question about someone who doesn't have a health a primary care provider or an office in Delaware. How, for healthy adults, how will they be able to get the vaccine? So there's going to be a lot of options as we move forward uh, for um, either high risk individuals and the general population as the vaccine rolls out. Just like now, you can get the flu shot at 
pharmacies and grocery stores. Um, in the spring, summertime, the vaccine will be widely available in, in pharmacies and places where you would normally get your flu shot. But it is going to be a little while before healthy adults um, are going to be able to, uh, you know, just stop by their supermarket and get the vaccine. Dr. Rute, a question about uh, what sort of preparation is needed or an observation will be needed immediately post vaccination for all, and especially for people uh, who, who may um, ha have some kind of reaction. Yes, yeah, so I'll start on that, but Dr. Hong being an emergency medicine physician, I'm gonna let him finish off. Um, you know, it, it is important, especially people who have, you know, a strong history of allergies, that um, that they are getting the vaccine in a place that's equipped to respond to like aller allergic reactions, that they have epinephrine, that they have oxygen if they need it. And so for most people, can get the vaccine and, um, uh, you know, as we said, pharmacies or, um, you know, a variety of different places. But for people who've had an allergic reactions, um, it's a reason why they should talk to their doctor first. They want to, um, to go to a place that is a equipped for a more serious reaction. Dr. Hong, do you want to add to that? No, that was perfect. And, you know, this could happen with any vaccine. This is not a special circumstance with COVID-19. So anyone who is vaccinated should have the proper equipment available in cases that uh, for this type of situation. So, so again, just as a reminder uh, for any vaccine uh, that you should have uh, the medication, the epinephrine, antihistamine, steroids, um, or other um, supplies needed in case there is an adverse effect. Uh, Dr. Rutan, Dr. Hong, there's a question about people who are vulner vulnerable. Uh, uh, will there be nurses going out to homes to deliver the COVID-19 vaccine to patients who maybe can't get to a pharmacy, can't get to their doctors, or uh, they don't want to put their loved ones at risk, but uh, to tr transport them to a place where they can get vaccinated? So we're looking at very different models and we do understand there is a population that is homebound or, or high risk to be leaving their homes. And I appreciate that they're staying at home. Number one, that's a good job piece. You wanna protect yourself. So we're looking up with looking uh, at different models. But again, I do wanna say that one of the things that we are concerned about is um, using up all our doses. So um, each vial may contain five doses or 10 doses. And once we tap into the vial, we have six hours to use up those doses. So there's an opportunity not just to vaccinate that one person who's homebound, but including family members in the home. You know, We wanna make sure we use up every dose the vaccine possible. So we're looking at those models as well um, and working closely with our partners to see opportunities to do so. So we're coming up on seven o'clock. So we'll take a couple more questions and then and then wind down. Uh, so we have a, a, someone who's a teacher who is 55 and she has asthma. She wants to know where she fits in. Great. Um, yes. So Teachers, you are essential workers for sure. Um, you, the, the work you do is critically important and um, you are serving the public. You are um, with um, other individuals. So you would fit into 1B. Um, again, we hope that we um, are able to begin rolling out 1B in January, February time period. So expect that um, you will hear from your school district or your employer um, at that time around what is the plan for um, uh, for educators. Um, and that includes early educators as well. Child care providers too fit in that category. Thank you. And then um, where will home health nurses be included in the first round? Are they considered frontline health care workers who are to be vaccinated? Uh, yes, they are. Absolutely. And we appreciate the work they do in providing care in the home setting for vulnerable populations. So we definitely want to support them. Uh, they are considered phase 1A. All right. And then uh, we have somebody, he's uh, 74 years old and lives in Landenburg, PA, but all of the medical records are in Delaware. Can I get the vaccine in Delaware? 
Yes, you can, especially, you know, the good reason is your medical records are here. You know, we're hoping that, you know, you know, your provider would be able to give it or we do have other opportunities. But again, what's most convenient for you, um, you know, depending on the situation, if there's a vaccination site closer to your home versus to where you, your medical home is, then that's something you should consider. But the option is there. And another question about reactions. Is the vaccine safe for people who have reactions to some drugs like Cipro or codeine? Yeah, so that goes back to this, the same question for people who have um, had allergic reactions. Um, again, we want to be cautious. At this point in time, the only contraindication is for people who have received, um, or who've had a reaction to th this particular vaccine in the past. But nonetheless, people who've had especially severe allergic reactions to medications or foods and have had an anaphylactic reaction need to talk to their doctor about the um, safe place for them to get the vaccine. Thank you. And Dr. Rutte, I think this is a, a good question a good, to end on. Is immunity lifelong after receiving the vaccine? Oh, if we all knew the answer to that question, it would be great. But what we do know is immunity doesn't, um, we don't know that immunity is that great after actually getting COVID-19. And it appears so far that immunity um, with this particular vaccine and the Moderna vaccine look um, looks strong. Um, but there's a lot we still have to learn as far as how long lasting that immunity is. So, you know, it will be learning along with the public um, as to whether, you know, like the flu shot, people might need an, you know, an annual um, booster of this. We just don't know right now. Thank you. And, and, and Dr. Tay and Dr. Hong, would you like to say any final words before we wrap up, Dr. Hong? Sure, I'll start. Um, and again, thank you for the opportunity uh, to talk to you about the vaccine. There's so much information and we are still learning, um, but we are excited with the uh, initial information uh, available. The efficacy rate of over 90% for both vaccines. Uh, the safety profile looks good as well too. And we all have to remember that the vaccine is a critical mitigation strategy to stop the spread of illness um, within the communities. Uh, so, you know, uh, hoping that this was valuable for you. There's additional information out there. We did share some resources. Um, so I think my main um, point, um, and I think it was brought up before, uh, is that the vaccine, um, we need, we need to get as many people vaccinated as possible, but we still need to follow infection control measures. Uh, that just because you get the vaccine doesn't mean that you are immune 100%. It doesn't mean that you potentially uh, can still um, transmit the disease to your loved ones. Um, so you need to still continue to wear your mask, uh, social distance, um, as well as wash your hands frequently. Uh, but you know, hopefully this session has been helpful for you and providing you accurate information and up-to-date information for you to make a, a, an appropriate decision for you. Dr. Tate? Yeah, I'll just end with saying, I mean, obviously it has been a really difficult year for Delawareans and for individuals a, a, a around the globe, but this is an exciting and historic day for us as Delawareans to have received this vaccine in our state, which we know is effective and safe. And I just, again, want to, um, you know, reiterate to Delawareans when it becomes available for you, please take advantage of, of this vaccine to protect yourself and your loved ones. So thank you very much. It was great to share this, um, this day with everyone. Thank you, Dr. Tay. Thank you, Dr. Hong. I want to say a special thank you to Pamela Dokio, our ASL interpreter, and our captioners as well. And I want to thank all of you for joining in this evening. We really appreciate it. We encourage you to get that vaccine, to keep uh, to wear your face mask, wash your hands, maintain that social distancing. And from all of us at DHSS, we want to wish you very happy holidays. May they be safe uh, and healthy. Take care, everybody. Good night. <laughs>